time. Tea time. Hello, friends. <laughs> Welcome back. Conspiracy, crime, and tea time. Yeah. <laughs> We're here. Here. Again. Here we are. Um, as always, to talk about a crime or a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually, listen, <laughs> this is a conspiracy, a mystery, a crime, and I bet they drink tea at one point in their <laughs> life, so it's a tea time. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about Johnny Gosh today. Gosh. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Gorsh. <laughs> All right, Goofy. Exactly. The Goofy movies. Dude. Top 10. They're the best. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Used to be obsessed with that movie. Me too. I just, I shared a meme the other day talking about, like, the pizza. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it oh, was, you commented on it. It looks yeah. so good. I know. Like, yeah. the and I remember that, like, pizza. water in the, um, in the hotel. I don't remember that. Where they, like, are eating that pizza. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, sorry guys. <laughs> um, we're going to go back to the early 1980s for this one. So, as we all know, in the 1980s, life was much simpler, right? Like, much. kids could be kids, mm -hmm. if you will. No, they could, like, go outside. They could do the things that they wanted to do. Like, I remember I had one friend when I was growing up in the 90s that her mom was like, okay, yeah, you guys can play. Just come back in when the uh, street when the streetlight on. comes yeah. on. But, like, that was the only mom that Dude, that was ever my life. That. Really? Well, I grew well, up where the story takes place. Yeah, <laughs> our story takes place in West Des Moines, Iowa, which is essentially... Shout out! Brittany was birthed <laughs> there, essentially. So, you know, I mean, more or less. It's, like, around the corner, right? Yeah, I grew up in Grimes, Iowa. Shout there out to my Grimes homies. Yeah. It's like 20 minutes away from West Des Moines. Yeah, so, I mean, it's like a very nice, seemingly, you know, good neighborhood, all the things. But, yeah, like, there was no cell phones back then. There was no tracking. You just came home whenever you wanted to. You rode your bike everywhere as a kid. Yeah. Like, those were real things. Good memories. And more importantly, during this time, most people didn't even know the word pedophile. They didn't worry about kidnappings. They didn't... Dude, this sweater makes me look large and in charge. Large Marge. <laughs> Name that movie. Fucking. Hold on. Pee Wee Herman. Pee Wee's Great Adventure. Yeah. yeah! <laughs> I used to love that movie. I was actually terrified at Large Marge. Um, that part in the truck where yeah. I, I, I was scared and, shitless. And he went in the diner and they were like, she's been dead. Yeah. <laughs> that like oh, honestly scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Speaking of pedophiles. I swear. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> but yeah, like people back in that time, they felt safer. They didn't, they knew about like stranger danger because that was like the thing to talk about. Like, don't talk to strangers. Um, but I mean, no, honestly, like I was people, one of those kids that would be out till the streetlights came on. Yeah, like, like there was no supervision. Literally riding my bike everywhere. But Iowa yeah. might have been a tad different because like it's like way less populated. Exactly. Way more safe, way less crime. So, like, especially back in those times, like, parents were just like, okay, see ya. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, you don't, especially, like, you know, like, when the neighborhood that Johnny Gosh lived in, it was an upper middle class area of West Des Moines. Mm -hmm. And so, it being upper middle class, like, the parents are not worried. They're like, yeah. oh, it's fine. Like, you know everyone in the neighborhood. It, it's all good. Like, just go play, have fun, come home. Mm -hmm. And so, that is what kind of happens to Johnny Gosh, right? He's 12 years old. Upper, upper middle class area west of moines with his mom noreen and his dad john senior so to their family they felt like they were in a safe town johnny was said to have been a very loving and caring child he loved to play with his friends he had started working a paper route to uh, save money to get a dirt bike so he was just like a good kid like a good little 12 year old boy doing his little paper route right and so, on September 5th, 1982, it was an average Sunday morning. Kids everywhere were getting ready to deliver their morning newspapers on, on their, you know, Sunday morning thing that they did. I don't have experience with that because... Okay, so I have a, like, I never had a paper route, mm -hmm. but, like, 
um, I had a friend and she had brothers and oh. like her brothers had a paper route mm-hmm. and I remember I would go to her house like after school and stuff sometimes and like I would like have to help them stuff the papers into like those little plastic sleeves. There would just yeah. be like literally hundreds of papers everywhere and you just had to like roll them up and stuff them in the sleeves. Yeah, it was like a seemingly good job for mm-hmm. kids, right, to earn a little bit of money, especially mm-hmm. again, the parents felt they're safe, they're in their own neighborhood, nothing bad is going to happen, right? Mm-hmm. Wrong. Not the case. <laughs> Wrongo. <laughs> Wrongo. <laughs> so typically Johnny would go on Sunday mornings with his dad and their dog Gretchen. Uh, to deliver the papers. We're talking like 5 a.m., okay? This is like... Yeah, yeah, like hella like early. Very, very early. Mm-hmm. So the previous night, Johnny asked his mom if he could do his paper route by himself. His mom was like, hail to the knock. <laughs> um, it's not clear how or why Johnny made it out of the house that morning without his dad, but he did take his dog. So Johnny and Gretchen, the dog, arrived at their paper drop. He uh, was set at the corner of 42nd and Mar Court. No more than one minute down the street from the Gosh family home. Mm. There, Johnny was scooped up. Oh, no. I'm sorry. There, Johnny scooped up <laughs> the thick bundle of papers. Sorry, funny. <laughs> he was scooped up. Um, he loaded them into his wagon and carried on uh, delivering his newspaper. Well, I don't know why, but, like, the wagon makes it, like, way more sad. I know. It's, like, so wholesome. It's just, like... It was, like... I saw pictures of it, too. I'll put it on our Instagram, but it was, like, oh, like, red wooden wagon it's with, like, it hurts like my heart. their name on it, and it was, like... <gasps> <gasps> but, yeah, so he went to deliver his papers, and he's never been seen again. Well, we'll see, but Hang generally on. speaking, <laughs> he's never been seen again. <laughs> Legitimately. Okay, that's all I can say about it. Okay, so by 7 a.m., perturbed neighbors started calling the Gosh home to complain that they hadn't received their paper yet. They're like, Johnny, be slacking, yo. They're like, seven? Um, I have my morning coffee. Where the hell is my paper? Johnny! So, um, at first, Johnny's parents thought maybe their son had overslept, so they checked his room, but he wasn't there. So, John Sr. went out to find his son and found the boy's abandoned wagon Mm. full of undelivered newspapers and the family dog about two blocks from home. Like, that is so heart-wrenching. That is so sad. Like, And, like, the newspapers are there, too. Like, I don't know. Those poor newspapers, man. (laughs) Never got to their homes, either. (sighs) Just hurts. So, by all accounts, Johnny wasn't the type of kid to run off and leave his dog and his deliveries behind. John Sr. and Noreen knew immediately that something was wrong. John Sr. came home and told his wife that their son was nowhere to be found. John and Noreen frantically alerted the police. However, since there had been no note or demand for ransom, the police ruled that the case was not a kidnapping and waited 72 hours before declaring Johnny missing and beginning their search. Like, I cannot even imagine, like, as parents, what they were feeling. Like, I... Not at all. Like, would not have slept, (sighs) would looked, have looked all over town, like, under every tree, leaf, rock corner crevice yeah i would have been like every yeah every stone would be searched okay no stone unturned that's that's the (laughs) saying but also like i understand why they have the 72 hour law i understand that but also at the same time i'm like even if you send like a couple officers to look it's really gonna cause that i'll pay you myself out of my fucking pocket like go look well especially back in those times like you know there was no he could have been doing anything. Like, he yeah. could have, like, gone off to a friend's. Like, he could, That's true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, they were more like, mm, he's a kid. He'll come back. Yeah. Like, but or just like, being naive. oh, he ran away. Like, not every kid hate, hates their life, okay? Right. <laughs> like, come on. They don't all want to run away. But in the meantime, John Sr. had been combing the neighborhood for his son and delivered the remaining papers. A lot of people thought it was, like, sus- like suspicious that the dad delivered the papers. But it makes sense if you think about it from the perspective that he was, like, walking through the neighborhood. So he was like, let me just Mm -hmm. deliver the paper. I don't know. Also, it's kind of like a wholesome thing to do. Maybe he's assuming, like, he isn't kidnapped. Maybe he is at a friend's house. Let me just... Yeah. Whatever. Um, According to Noreen... It took the cops 45 minutes to arrive at their house after she called them, Mm -mm. even though the police department was located about 10 blocks away. They're like, yeah, it's not that important. I gotta finish this donut. "Mm, Fuck that kid. (laughs) Um, It's really sad, though. Like, a lot of these cases, man, like, tons of them, 
if the cops that were involved would have just done their due diligence. I mean, with this one specifically, I don't think it was going to matter. It, I really don't. Like, if the cops were, you know, willing to help more more than they did, I don't think it would have really made a difference. But in a lot of cases, I'm like, how do these cops get jobs? For real, though. Like, if you don't want to actually help the people, then just fuck off, please. Mm -hmm. Let the people take the jobs that want to do it and be helpful, mm -hmm. please. Not to malign police officers i know your job is hard okay <laughs> i'm just saying like there's a lot of cops out there that fucking suck dude i think it was bailey sarian um shout out to bailey mm -hmm. but i think in one of her episodes i like watched recently she was talking about she was like why don't police departments or like um you know people who investigate things detective <laughs> detectives <laughs> she's like why don't they um just like hire people who are into this stuff she's like because seriously yeah. i think that i could get some shit done seriously and it's like for real like if you just like tell us what's up and like give us the tools to get a, yeah. the job done like i think that like everyday people who are into this type of thing like could really figure some shit out <laughs> i wholeheartedly agree with that i'm like at least have like a volunteer program yes that's something. what she meant yeah yeah yeah, yeah that would be so dope because i'm like that way it takes the stress off of the police officers and detectives. And also, it's like, if you have multiple people coming to you with the same conclusion, because there were a lot of, like, I think in the episode we did about the two guys that were wrongfully convicted, uh, LaVon yeah. Brooks mm -hmm. and, I forget, Kennedy... Some, Brewer. Brewer, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, like, that a lot of that had to do with just the fact that they were black and mm -hmm. the cops were racist. So I'm like, if you have volunteers or outside sources helping you <coughs> that to me feels like it's gonna like lessen the fact of racism or prejudice or anything yeah. like that but who who's to say who's who to say we? i mean shit but you know what i am gonna say that what does tie into the fact of all the shit that people are talking about right now about it's a trigger warning to say defund the police because I don't... We need cops, okay? We need them. I'm not saying to defund the cops, but I'm just saying, like, to me, that's, like, the whole message. Outsource the things that are not pertinent for cops to do, please. Mm -hmm. That's all. I still love the cops, and I need them. Yes, okay? we need them. Just... <laughs> just that's why I... That's it. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. So the the family, uh, Noreen and John Sr., spoke to their neighbors. It became clear to them that Johnny had been kidnapped. Multiple people reported seeing a man in a blue Ford Fairmont talking to Johnny. One neighbor, who was a retired lawyer named John Rossi, said that he saw Johnny giving directions to the man in a car when Johnny asked Rossi if he could help the man with directions. The man pulled the door shut and started the engine, but before he left... He reached up and he flicked on the dome light, like, I guess, his headlights, three mm -hmm. times. And then he pulled out, left, blowing through a stop sign in the process. Mm -hmm. Johnny is later, it's reported later that he told one of his friends that he was afraid of that guy. And he was, like, giving him weird vibes. Mm -hmm. So. Sketch. <sighs> sus. Yeah, very sus. <laughs> and not just that, like, I also was reading that the retired lawyer said that it was very peculiar for him to, like, why would a grown man be asking a child for direction? I don't know. Yeah, that's really weird. Maybe he was just, like, he was a lawyer, maybe. He was inquisitive. I'm just mm -hmm. saying. He was like, why? Okay. So, Noreen believes the driver flicked the dome lights of his uh, vehicle three times to signal someone else. And one of the paper boys reported that he saw a tall man walk out from behind a couple of houses after the paper boys were approached by the man in the vehicle. Noreen is convinced that this was the person who snatched her son. It was later revealed that the vehicle displayed a Nebraska license plate, which became increasingly important as time went on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nebraska. Oh, yeah. We took a trip to the Omaha, um, Nebraska Zoo whenever I was in middle school. Really? Mm -hmm. Because it was only, like, three hours away. Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm hmm Just buckle up, baby. Buckled. Another sighting of this encounter was from a neighbor named Mike, who had woken up to get a glass of water, and he could see out of his window the whole interaction. Hmm. Um, Johnny started to head home, and Mike noticed another man following him. 
Why at that point Mike did literally fucking nothing? I don't know. <laughs> He's like, hmm. hmm. There's an odd man following Johnny. This coffee's good. Good luck. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what the fuck? I mean, I guess, and especially too, like, again, it's like 5 45, 6 a.m. He's probably like, <sighs> but it's I like don't people, happening. people yeah. aren't just like out at that time. Maybe they were. Were they? I don't know. People and I were weird. Okay. <laughs> You said it. You heard it here first. JK. So the first couple of hours of this investigation, the police made critical mistakes. The chief of police at the time, Orville Cooney, had stepped onto a park table uh, with a bullhorn and told a group of searchers to stop looking for the boy because he was just a runaway. Orville Cooney. That's a fucking name. What a name. (laughs) Orville Redenbacher. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. As the Goshes were frantically trying to get the FBI involved in the case, he'd also said to us, um, wait. <laughs> so sorry. Hold on. He'd also said, to us, he's a runaway until you prove he's in danger. Frustrated with the sluggish response of law enforcement, John and Maureen went on television and distributed over 10,000 posters with their son's pictures on it. Picture on it. Gosh was even one of the first children to be placed on the side of milk cartons throughout the United States in an effort to raise awareness about missing children. Yep. The infamous milk cartons. I know. Didn't work. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry about it. So although the Goshes, ma- ma- their last name is like so tricky to say, it like gets like stuck in my mouth <laughs> like for some tongue twisted. Yeah. Okay. Although the Goshes' masses- <laughs> massive <laughs> efforts ensured the word of their son's abduction was spread, this also led to prank callers phoning the family with false claims, which is a very fucked up thing to do. Like very. Why? Like, I how twisted is it to give a family like false hope false like that. hope like oh i saw johnny bitch Mm-mm. pixar didn't happen okay back <laughs> in that time though they just had polaroids get them developed Shut and then, down, yeah my picture. <laughs> john senior and noreen were met with shock a shocking level of indifference by the west des moines police department but according to the then rookie cop lieutenant jeff miller the police started hunting for the boy immediately he said that they went ahead and called in the staff, the troopers, they called in detectives, the reserves, contacted Polk County sheriffs. That's my county. The state patrol. At that point, they did a door-to-door canvas of the neighborhood trying to find someone who saw something of Johnny. The police also searched the nearby woods, but were still unwilling to consider the possibility of child abduction. So the search was a lazy one at best. Mm. And I guarantee you they're just trying to cover their ass. <clears throat> totally. Because they never fucking found him. So, I mean, <sighs> again, though, like I said, I don't think, even if they like were like the first second, like, let's find him now. I don't, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, Mm-mm. who knows what actual time he was taken in conjunction to them being called at like seven he could have already been gone for like an hour or two you know in 1993 noreen and john gosh divorced seemingly due to the stress of trying to find johnny yeah i can't imagine yeah almost two years after johnny went missing another paper boy disappeared eugene martin went missing on august 12 1984 He disappeared while delivering newspapers on the south side of Des Moines. The only evidence left were these undelivered papers. The police still don't believe these cases are linked, and not unlike Johnny, no one knows where he went or what fate he met, and and the case has gone cold. So sad. So, so sad. There was another boy, too, who also went missing that was a paper boy, but it didn't have his name, so I didn't, like, notate Mm. it, but it did happen. There were three of them. Okay, wow. Yeah. As suspected, this case caused an incredible amount of national interest and a whole lot of controversy. Noreen Gosh became increasingly vocal about the inadequacies of the law enforcement that she was dealing with, and the idyllic times of the 1980s were met with the harsh reality that there were, in fact, people kidnapping children from small towns. Again, like, this this is not stuff that people... Like, people were not into true crime at this no. time. They were not like, oh, people kidnap kids. Like, no. Yeah, uh-uh. No, that was not. So, like, especially for this to get national attention, people were probably, like, horrified. 
Oh, yeah. I can't. Like, we weren't even born yet, so mm-hmm. I really don't know. But I can only imagine. Oh, yeah. For sure. Um, in 1985, Noreen claims Johnny left a handwritten <clears throat> note on a dollar bill taken as change by a grocery clerk in Sioux City, Iowa. I am alive, scribbled just above the signature, Johnny Gosh. Um, these handwriting experts Three. resurrect... Uh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, it's fine. Three handwriting experts resurrect the Gosh's hopes for good when they authenticate the signature as Johnny's. Maureen receives the occasional phone call she believes to be either from Johnny himself or someone that knows her son's whereabouts, including one from a man claiming to be Johnny's kidnapper, calling to boast, I have Johnny, he's alive, you can look for him all you want, but you're never going to find him. Dang! That's messed up. So fucked up. The calls increase proportional to notoriety which is now nationwide in scope but authorities can trace none of them so to um so also with reported sightings of johnny um concentrated mostly in the south and southwest the sporadic and unpredictable um hints at proof of life solidify the goshes in their belief that johnny is still alive but by 1989 Johnny is still missing, and there's little movement in his case until the arrest of our boy, Paul Bonacci. Bonacci! Dude, that last name is cool. I know. <laughs> it's a it's a great last name. I, it has to be, like, Bonacci. Italian. yeah. Yeah. Chef's kiss. <laughs> he was arrested in November, and, like, let me retract the fact that I said our boy, because he's a he's fucked up person. So, but, anyway. In November, uh... Of 1989, on uh, he was arrested for four counts of sexual assault on a child. During this time, he told his attorney, John DeCamp, that he had been abducted into a sex trafficking ring with Johnny Gosh as a teenager and was later forced to participate in Johnny's kidnapping. Hold the phone. I know. So, okay, this is weird. What? This is just like a random thought. Sorry, I'm thinking out loud. Okay, okay so I'm from this area of Iowa, right? Uh-huh. And I know somebody with the last name DeCamp. And I wonder really? if he's related to John DeCamp. Maybe. Ask him. Because how weird. That is, that, and that, like, not a common last name. No. Hmm. Maybe. Continue. Just gets trickier and trickier, man. <laughs> Um, but Paul Bonacci also said that he knows for a fact that Johnny is still alive. While he was imprisoned in Lincoln, Nebraska, Bonacci goes on tape to tell investigators he helped physically subdue Johnny, forcing him into the car before chloroforming him to unconsciousness in the back seat. Bonacci's sudden admission from behind bars pulls back the curtain on an endlessly layered labyrinth conspiracy that would implicate high-level power brokers around the country. Yuck. So hear us out, okay? Because this is where gets a little twisted okay so okay. if you weren't listening now's the time to listen okay okay here we go formally diagnosed as having what was then known as multiple personality disorder or npd Bonacci channels mark anderson his 15 year old alter ego said to have been <laughs> created to help paul cope with years of sexual abuse Anderson tells police that his role in Johnny's kidnapping was only one of countless crimes he'd been coerced into at gunpoint by his own abductor, a man known only as the Colonel. Right? That's how you say that? Yep. Okay. (laughs) Kentucky Fried Chicken, bro. That's right. Such a weirdly spelled word. Yeah, why is it spelled colonial? Can someone tell me? I don't like that. I don't, because every time in my head I'm, I'm saying like, colonial, yeah. but my mouth is saying colonel. <laughs> like second guess myself. Okay, so the colonel was working as a high level operative in a vast organization of predatory pedophiles operating a very lucrative human trafficking operation. Bonacci said that Johnny Gosh was just one of the countless small boys swallowed up by the network and had been bought and sold around the country since his abduction, as Bonacci himself had. Rarely did the overlords of the t- this child sex ring ever kill their hostages because they represented valuable property. They needed to be kept alive to generate more pornography that pedophiles would pay high dollar for to say nothing of auctioning them off to the highest bidder, often wealthy elites ready to shell out a premium for fresh young flesh. Bonacci's tale, however incredible, gave final validation to Noreen's increasingly wishful belief that Johnny was still alive. Wow. (sighs) 
an interesting thing that Noreen said in the documentary that I watched about um, Johnny Gosh. She, I don't know like verbatim what the words were, but she basically was like, you know, at that time in the documentary, they detailed how like pedophiles had like a magazine that they like knew about, right? Like now in our times, they have like the dark web and mm-hmm. that sick fucking disgusting shit, but they had like a magazine, right? And so she was like, you know, if these people are using, you know, like if an average person is a pedophile, they have to go and risk themselves being put in prison to fulfill that desire that they have. And she basically was like, what do you think that a high level elite member of society is going to do? Like, do you think that they're going to risk themselves or are they going to use somebody else to do it for them? So she is like wholeheartedly behind the fact that this is most likely accurate for what Paul Bonacci is saying. Yuck. Yeah. So assessing the veracity of Paul Bonacci's story requires a closer look at the explosive scandal unfolding in Omaha, Nebraska between 1988 and 1991. Hmm. So, prominent businessman and political figure Lawrence E. King, aka Larry King, was head of the Franklin Community Federal Credit Union in Omaha from the late 80s to the early 90s. King was a star around town. He dressed in designer suits. He uh, kept up appearances with all of the elites. He was also rising to political... Uh, be a political figure, holding various prominent positions within the Nebraska GOP, even appearing twice at the Republican National Convention to sing the national anthem. Hmm. By all accounts, King lived lavishly. He had luxury cars. He flew in, like, private jets. But in hindsight, it must have been pretty obvious that he would have had to have a second income. Uh, And he did, because $38 million's worth was all embezzled from their credit union that he was running. Sus. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) The ensuing investigation and indictment came with allegations no one could have anticipated. So he was indicted on those crimes, 100%. I know that's a fact. But what we'll come to find out is even more disturbing than embezzlement. (laughs) So... According to several witnesses and alleged victims, King was the facilitator of an enormous pedophile operation. Franklin Credit Union had been established as a benefactor of Omaha's Boys Town, a hallmark of the city widely lauded as one of the world's best charities for disadvantaged youth. Accusers claim that King used the partnership with Boys Town to pimp out poor homeless adolescents to wealthy donors and shot callers. A two-year investigation followed, examining the validity of claims that span everything from drug abuse and orgies to satanic rituals. Multiple plaintiffs testify under oath that they were forced into sexual slavery and torture at the hands of paying customers, often at sex parties happening in and around Omaha. The charges mesh with those of Paul Bonacci, who not only says he was lured into the Franklin network himself and sold off to wealthy elites for sexual gratification, but also that Franklin was the hub of a national trafficking network that reached all the way to the White House. So the thing is, <laughs> saying it, the thing is, two of the Franklin accusers would be indicted on perjury charges. Uh, with one actually going to prison for her role in what would finally be dismissed as a hoax. But a lot of people still felt like it was a cover-up because, like, especially during this time, it is not uncommon. I mean, how are you going to prove those things, right? Like, right. you, it is your word against theirs. A judge is obviously going to assume that you're lying. I'm sorry. Like, that's just what the, the facts are, right? Um, and... Another reason why people felt like it was a cover-up, because Paul Bonacci had a lot of details. He had, like, tons of details, and he um, was sticky. Like, his story never changed. Every person that he told a story to, it was consistent. He was not lying, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that has to give him a little bit of credibility, because most Mm -hmm. times in investigations, when people are lying, they change details because they're they're not true. They're making them up, right? Mm Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so Bonacci was sticking to his claim that he and Johnny, along with several other boys, were 
confined to a hole dug beneath a ranch home in rural Colorado. Wow. He doubles down on this claim when he takes the America's Most Wanted team to the actual house. Mm-hmm. And I saw the footage in the documentary. Okay, like he, this is like facts. So upon arrival, Bonacci breaks down seemingly on cue if he would have been faking, right? Mm -hmm. And nearly hyperventilates, unable to revisit the sight of so many unspeakable horrors. Composing himself, he leads the film crew into a scene shown exactly as he had described it. Oh, wow. A pit dug beneath the house where he says he was stowed away for safekeeping until the next buyer showed up. What Bonacci showed America, American viewers from America's Most Wanted um, next were breadcrumbs left behind Oof, from victims. Me chills. I know of commercial pedophilia, but that wasn't all. There were another. There were other alleged victim there that day, and he was a runaway by the name of Jimmy. Jimmy had previously described the house in fine detail as well, and he said he too had been stashed there, and he also had a brand on his skin to prove it, known as the Rocking X. Uh, the brand was seared into the flesh of trafficked children. Benacci had previously mentioned that detail to the investigators. Yuck. So this guy also, I don't really know the logistics of like how that Jimmy guy just so happened to be there or maybe Paul contacted him to come as well. But when they went to the house, there were like kids initials inscribed on the wood, like underneath the house. It was like a whole open room with like rafters and beams and that were made of wood. It's like very yuck. Horrific. Real yuck. Yeah, very yuck. <laughs> Ugh. Evil. I swear. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Another SpongeBob reference. <laughs> Evil. <laughs> SpongeBob is my dream. Man, man, bro. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just love like the the writers of SpongeBob. Do <laughs> like the Invisible Bowmobile. Ooh. <laughs> Sorry, about that's that. my attempt to make some light of, of, the situation. of this horrific situation. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so Nari makes the decision to go speak to Paul Bonacci after learning he told investigators that Johnny was alive. Noreen believes that Paul Bonacci is telling the truth because he disclosed information to her regarding Johnny that was not made aware to the public. He disclosed conversations between himself and Johnny that contained personal details only known by Johnny's mother. The police of West Des Moines refused to interview Paul Bonacci. They are said to have interviewed his siblings who claim Paul is, uh, was in Nebraska on the day Johnny disappeared. Therefore, there was no need to speak to Paul himself. Nebraska is about a two-hour drive from West Des Moines. The story only gets messier from here. In 1999, Paul Bonacci... Sue's disgraced banker and alleged sadist, Lawrence King. Paul Bonacci is awarded $1 million as a result. King never bothered to respond to the suit, therefore this was um, a default judgment. Bonacci's never seen a dime, and he never will. The case required testimony from Noreen, and she dropped a huge bombshell while in court that would give Johnny Gosh's disappearance a new life. She was asked by the judge whether she had seen Johnny since his disappearance, and Noreen paused, glanced at the camp, Paul's attorney, and answered, yes, she had seen Johnny himself. Like, what? In the documentary, when she's talking about this, she was like, I I should have just said nothing. You fucking duh. If if you're being honest with what you're telling us, yeah, you should have kept that shit to yourself. So dumb. I mean, I'm glad from, like, our perspective, like, thank God she said that, because that just made this, like, juicy, like, a nice juicy. medium rare steak. Like, <laughs> juicy. So she hadn't bothered to tell anyone, um, and her reasoning for this was because she knew doing so would further endanger Johnny. Her story was that Johnny had knocked on her door in the wee hours of the night sometime in 1996 and hung out for over an hour detailing to his mother all the abuse and torture endured during 17 years of sex slavery. 14 years of (laughs) sex slavery. I don't know how that turned into a seven. Same shit. Um, (laughs) He made sure Noreen understood she could say nothing to anyone before disappearing into the night once more. The drama had come full circle and Johnny hasn't been seen since for the second time. And, like, the crazy thing, too, is 
I don't know my opinion wholeheartedly yet. Like, I haven't formed my whole opinion if I believe Noreen or not. But it's one of those things where, like, let's say it is true. And her son is alive and he did go to see her. He knows no matter what. Even if she's like, yeah, he came to see me. We're all like, <laughs> no, he didn't. No, no, he didn't. Like, no one's going to believe that. Like, if he knew, like, that telling her all that stuff would endanger him, then, like, why would he even risk going there in the first place? Right. Like, what? Like, I know, dude. That is a whole other, like, factor, too. I don't know. But then part of me wants to believe it. Because I'm like, you know, it seems to me, like, after she kind of discloses um, in the documentary this information, she kind of seems more at peace and but, like, less, like, heartbroken. But also... I would have been like, look, Johnny, son. Like, okay, first of all, that would be, like, horrific to have him tell you all that horrible stuff that yes. had happened to him. But it's like, okay, so you've been searching for him. Here he is. Like, freaking get him into the witness protection program. There are right. things that you can do to protect your child that's coming to you with all this horrific stuff. Don't just let him go back. No, I know. Like, That's where I'm like, and I will say, like, no judgment to Noreen because obviously yeah. she went through a hard time. She did seem a little bit like the a couple screws a might be a little <laughs> loose, especially after like all the time when she's talking about it. Because I'm like, yeah, I feel the same way. It is said that Johnny had another guy with him. I don't know who the guy was, but I would be like, I get my gun out and be like, who the fuck is that? Yeah, <laughs> the fuck out of here. Get the get the, get the fuck out. Like. <laughs> And then I would call the cops immediately, not the West Des Moines cops, first of all, because they'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, let's take him with us. Disappear again. Hmm. Some, something is, like, very sus with hmm. those cops. Because I'm like... Super sus. That is over-the-top laziness. Maybe they already know about the sex trafficking. They, it's right. possible. It is completely possible. And they're, like, in on it somehow. Oh, my mother is calling me. Bobby. I'll call her back. Hey, Bobby. Bobby. <laughs> So, the most recent <clears throat> bizarre wrinkle in this case came in 2006 when a mysterious envelope is dropped on Noreen's doorstep. The content contents are grotesque. Several photos of male juveniles bound and gagged, staring wide-eyed and helpless into the camera. Ugh. They're like Polaroid pictures. Um, one of the boys vaguely resembles Johnny. Noreen is once again unwavering in her belief that the clue... Uh, involves her son. She knows without a doubt that one of the photos depicts her son. The origin of the ghastly photographs has never been traced. There was one photo of three boys that have been confirmed uh, from, to be from Florida and were part of a case worked by Florida detective Nelson Zalava <laughs> in 1979. However, the boy pictured that resembles Johnny Gosh has never been identified and Noreen believes that that is her son hmm. wholeheartedly weird very weird so strange so johnny gosh has still not been found and would now be 51 years old if he is in fact still alive mm -hmm. um there is a slight sl silver lining that came from this case thanks to the persistence of noreen gosh in 1984 Iowa passed the Johnny Gosh bill, which required police to investigate missing children cases immediately rather than wait 72 hours as they had in Gosh's case, which is a fantastic idea. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I love that. I think she also started a foundation. Um, I don't know exactly what they do. I think she started it like very soon after mm -hmm. Johnny went missing. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I mean, honestly, look, Johnny Gosh, if you're alive, you're 51. It's time. Just let us know. Show yourself. <laughs> let us know. I mean, I'm going to... I hope you're all right. I mean, yeah, wholeheartedly. It's That is, like, one of the things, though. Um, obviously, Johnny Gosh is a victim in one way or another. Absolutely. We don't know what of. But if it is true that he did go see his mom and he wasn't willing to, like, come forward, mm -hmm. would that possibly mean that he may be involved in like some nefarious things hmm. i don't know it is said and maybe this he was whole... like forced to be so. right yeah, yeah like in the whole sex trafficking thing like most i think paul bonacci said in the documentary that they would the like leaders would make them do illegal stuff so they felt fear to come forward so Absolutely. they wouldn't be like okay. getting in trouble yes so okay so i was just telling tara little side note that I was watching that 
docu-series. I don't know if any of y'all have seen it. If you haven't, check it out. And then we're also planning on making a podcast about it, but about that cult um, Nixium. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's kind of like this, a similar thing. A sex trafficking ring is involved type thing, and like um, to be a part of this group, which they don't really realize what they're getting into, they have to put up collateral, and they mm-hmm. have to like send like basically sounds so like, they could get blackmailed if they try to leave or try to out the organization sounds a little bit like scientology yeah yeah no it's been um uh compared to that a lot yeah mm-hmm. but yeah so i mean and then like the women have to recruit other women and then so like they could be um charged with you know those things if it came out because then they are involved in that Ugh. criminal act and it's like a whole it's a whole thing it's a whole ass mess <laughs> All you disgusting humans out there. Okay, probably not the ones listening to this, but they're... Let's hope. <sighs> Why? Why do people do this? I'm like, what's wrong with you? Eve! <laughs> I swear. I'm just For like... Real? I cannot wrap my head. We, we'll have to do... There's a podcast called Hunting Warfare, which is a very good podcast. It's based in um, Canada. But, like, that is about the dark web and Ooh. how they, like, caught this, like, pedophile. It's... <laughs> the most disgusting shit but it's like one of those things where you're so compelled to like understand yeah it's like i i want to somehow understand what the fuck is wrong with these people but like like there's there's no no, understanding no there's no redeeming qualities no there's no logic like yeah no good reasoning behind it no and that's where i'm like is there like truly is there something wrong like in their brains like you know how they say serial killers like mm-hmm. the their frontal lobe is like underdeveloped or they had trauma mm-hmm. to their frontal lobe mm-hmm. like what about pedophiles what the fuck do their brains look like and can we like kill one and examine it because fuck it i'm fine <laughs> oh let's uh, look at jeffrey epstein's brain hey truly like <laughs> hello who can help us with this no, but for real. We need it now. I don't know. Something's, I mean, there's definitely wires crossed and people like that. 100%. Yeah, there has to be, right? Oh, for sure. Or like, you know, I also understand too, like, <clears throat> for Paul Bonacci's... No compassion, like, no empathy, nothing. like For sure. But yeah, like, for Paul Bonacci, you know, he was also a victim. And then he then became a victim as well, or uh, mm-hmm. turned people into victims as well. So that yeah. is like a whole other, like, can of worms. But still, like, y'all... <laughs> See therapists, please. <laughs> Not sponsored, but no. um, the BetterHelp app is readily available. <laughs> Seriously, though, <laughs> shit. Like, that is in the, I think it was the Hunting War, Warhead um, podcast I listened to. I think they asked the guy, like, why didn't you go see, like, a therapist when he started having these, like, feelings, you mm-hmm. know, as he claims to, like, be attracted to children. And he's like, well, I did, but, like, you know, I I didn't like the therapist, so I just never went back. Okay, so no, no, you didn't. You didn't. You fucking poor excuse for a fucking human. (sighs) Do better, guys. Let's all do better. Like, let's be kind. Let's make it a goal for 2021. Be nice to each other. Yeah. Who cares about politics? Like, let's go back to, like you know, po- like, right, post 9-11, like, 9-12. Let's go to that day, right? <laughs> I mean, it's unfortunate that the things happened on 9-11, and I would never, you know, want to relive those experiences. But as a nation, we were also, like, unified. Right. Yeah, we were in this together. Mm-hmm. Let's all, you know, for the greater good, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Can we do that, please? Please. Doubtful. I know. <laughs> <sighs> but there's always hope, you know? We can there only is. do our part. Mm-hmm. So be kind. Be nice. But for that episode, guys, that's all about all we got. Yep, that's it. Uh, mystery, conspiracy, whatever, what have you. I don't know. But um, as always, thank you for listening. We appreciate it. Give us a thumbs up. Click the bell icon yes. to subscribe. Leave us a review on Apple or Spotify or Google or wherever. All the things. Yeah, all the things. And we'll see you guys next time. Love ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.